First, and also later than published, Patrick Moore takes out his telescope for another inspection of the sky at night. Good evening. Last month, I told you about Nova Cygni, the new star in the Swan. And here's a photograph of it, taken last November by Harold Redley. Now, at that stage, the Nova, it's that bright thing in the middle, was at its peak brightness. And you could then see it without a telescope. It's faded down now, I'm afraid, but at least it was the only naked eye Nova we've had for some years. Now, I wonder if you recognize this. I did show it on a Sky at Night program a little while ago. It's the only close-range photograph of a minor planet or asteroid. This is Gaspra, less than 20 miles across, photographed last November by the Galileo spacecraft on its way to Jupiter. And it's asteroids I want to discuss now. But first of all, what exactly are they? As I think most people know, the solar system is divided firmly into two parts. We begin with four small solid planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars, and they see other orbits. Then there's a wide gap, and then we come to giant Jupiter, the first of the really large planets. And in that gap, in this region, there move thousands of very small worlds, and these are the minor planets. And here we have a diagram of the positions of these planets as they were uh, a few months ago. And you can see that most of them do keep very firmly to that area, but there are some that don't, and those, I think, are the really interesting ones. But most of the asteroids are very small. The very first one to be discovered, way back in 1801, was Ceres by Piazzi. And Ceres is the only asteroid with a diameter of more than 500 miles. And as you can see, it's quite big. It could co cover quite a large part of England. And all the other asteroids are smaller than that. There are only a handful with diameters of more than 200 miles, and most of the rest are mere chunks of rock. Now today, more than 4,000 are known and their origin and nature had been very much under discussion. They could be simply debris left over when the main planets were formed, and possibly no planet could form around there because of the gravitational disruptive pull of Jupiter. Or it might be that they are remnants of a planet that broke up. And at this stage, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Ewan Williams of Queen Mary and Westfield College. Now, he's an asteroid specialist, and he's recently been out in La Palma, on the island Canary Islands, using the JKT, or Captain Telescope there, to make very special studies. So delighted to welcome you, Ewan. Thank you. First of all, what about these asteroids? Are they really the remains of a shattered planet? Uh, I suspect not. I think there are three main reasons for believing that they may, may well not be. The first is the total mass of the asteroid belt, if you add them all together, is far, far less than even the smallest of the planets. So there's a missing mass problem. The second is the actual orbits of the asteroids. Even though they are well confined, as you say, to a main belt, if there was a, a shattering of a single parent, one would expect to find in all the orbits a common point. By that, all, I mean all the orbits would actually go through the collision point, as we see in the diagram on the screen here. There is a common point in the three orbits there. We would expect to find that in all the orbits and that is not the case. And the final point is that asteroids do indeed fall into a number of very different types, and this is very indicative of possibly a number of different parents. Well, let's say a bit about the nature and the composition of the asteroids. Um, they fall into, I suppose, four main categories, and this is very closely related to uh, meteor, meteorites, rather, which we see on Earth. It's fair, fair to say, probably, there's no essential difference between um, a large meteorite and a small asteroid. No, I think that's almost certainly right. In terms of, of the composition we have, we have the stony asteroids, which are very closely matched to the stony meteors, and we have a typical example on the table here of a stone meteorite, which is the Barwell meteorite. Another very popular class is the metallic asteroids, and we have on the screen a picture of a typical metal, metal meteorite, which is in fact the one responsible for the Arizona meteor crater. Um, the third class is the sort of carbonaceous, um, and we can see a carbonaceous meteorite there. Um, there's also a fourth type, which is the D-type asteroids. These are darker and are basically thought to be covered at least by hydrocarbons, um, which are 
the same sort of elements that were found on the surface of the nucleus of Comet Halley. Um, now, as well as having these um, differences, there is a distance difference. For example, the stony meteorites, and therefore the stony asteroids, come from well within the inner parts of the asteroidal belt. We move out, the seas tend to be concentrated slightly further out, and certainly the D seem to be well in the outer part of the main asteroid belt. As well as that, we have, if we look at the Ds themselves, they seem to get redder as we move further out, as we see in this diagram, for example, at Hidalgo and Achilles. Those are very red, as opposed to the far less red ones further in. Well, that's probably very significant, isn't it? Because after all, even though the main asteroids, and all the large ones, do keep strictly to that one belt between Mars and Jupiter, they do tend to um, uh, form up in clumps called families. Yes, there are well-known families of asteroids. That, as you say, most of the asteroids are in the main belt, so we should stress that, that. But we also have the Trojan asteroids, which form a very distinct group, also the Hildas and the Hungarias. And if we see on the diagram, we can see the main belt shaded fairly firmly in yellow, with the Hungarias on the inside, with the Hildas the other side, and the Trojans further out at 5.2 AU and fairly clear gaps between these. Uh, these gaps are the well-known Kirkwood gaps. Discovered by Daniel Kirkwood a long time ago. Indeed, yes, and named after him. And if we look at a, a histogram plotting the numbers of asteroids against distance, we can see fairly clearly that there are certain regions where essentially there are no asteroids, and these correspond to the so-called resonance regions where the asteroid goes around, for example, twice or three times um, for every one orbit of Jupiter. Well, Jupiter, of course, is the dominant factor here. I mean, Jupiter is more massive than all the other planets put together. But I'm thinking particularly in the so-called Trojans. And here, back to our diagram, the main belt again, there is the orbit of Jupiter, and you can see that both ahead of Jupiter and behind Jupiter are some asteroids, the so-called Trojans, and they move exactly in the same orbit as Jupiter, something like 483 million miles from the Sun. So even though they're fairly large by asteroidal standards, I mean, sometimes more than 100 miles across, they're pretty faint. But they're in no danger of being swallowed up. No, as you've just said, Patrick, they are on exactly the same orbit as Jupiter, moving in front of and behind. They're actually all so exactly the same distance from Jupiter as they are from the Sun, so they form an equilateral triangle. Um, these form quite a dyna an interesting dynamical situation. If we're close to the Sun, we get nice circular orbits, such as the orbit of the planets, which is well known to us, Mars um, and the Earth, and indeed all the inner planets. As we move out to Jupiter, we have close to Jupiter, again, closed circular orbits, the orbits of all the satellites of Jupiter, which are well known to us. But if we look at the Trojans, when the Trojans are closed, are away from Jupiter, they will be more or less moving on a circular orbit around the Sun. But as the asteroid approaches Jupiter, it gets accelerated by the field of Jupiter, increases angular momentum, which in turn increases the centrifugal force, and it moves out a bit. Now, if we use a large computer, we can produce the great mass of orbits, as you see on the screen there. And you can see Jupiter um, and the Sun in the black areas, and all these nice closed orbits with the Trojans again showing up very well, 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind. And if you overlay those orbital diagrams with the previous diagram we had of where all the asteroids are, we can indeed see how they fit very, very nicely onto this diagram with the Trojans exactly in those closed loops which we saw in the computer simulation. So the Trojans are definitely safe. And there's also one Martian Trojan now moving in the same orbit as Mars. There's a Martian Trojan and also possibly an Earth Trojan. Um, the Earth Trojan may well actually be just a bit of a rocket. <laughs> I wonder. Martian Trojan 1991 MB, not yet named. And some of these asteroid names are rather fun, aren't they? They are indeed. I think the early ones were, of course, named after classical and mythological characters. Ceres, Pallas, Juno, Vesta, the first four. And similarly, when we talk about the Trojans, they were heroes of the Trojan War. But when you run up to numbers like 200 and 300, you <laughs> begin to run out of classical names. And you have to do. start think of more interesting names. And Mr. Spock from S USS Enterprise, for example, has one asteroid. And indeed, I think people around this table may contribute to this uh, 
naming ceremony as well. Yes, perfectly true. Some time ago, Dr. Bowell in Arizona discovered asteroid 2602. He actually named it Moore after me. And there it is on the end of the arrow. And it's so faint, I've not yet seen it with my telescope. But um, you have an asteroid too. I have an asteroid which uh, has one uh, peculiarity <laughs> about it. Williams was already named <laughs> after another asteroid. And therefore, when they came to naming my asteroid, they actually gave it the name Ewan, which um, is one of the few asteroids actually named after the first name only of an astronomer. And on the screen, we can see that Ewan is also a fairly distant asteroid. It is partially in the main belt, but mostly in the outer part of the main belt. What number are you? I'm number 3634. Newcomer? Yes. Let's come now, Cammy, for the so-called Earth grazers. Now, all these may asteroids that swing away from the main swarm and may come into the Earth, Earth's orbit, they are all pretty small, only a few miles across in most cases. The first discovered of them in 1898 was Eros. And that's shaped rather like a sausage and roughly comparable in size with the Isle of Wight. And that can come within 15 million miles of us. But that record has been broken since. I remember, for example, in 1937, a very small asteroid, Hermes, only about a mile across, brushed past us at less than twice the distance of the moon and gave rise to some rather spectacular newspaper headlines, I remember. And, of course, I mean, even smaller asteroids. There's one, Hathor, that is no, no more than about 30 yards across. Now, as we said earlier, there's probably no difference between a large meteorite and a small asteroid. And meteorites can land on the Earth and they can cause craters. I suppose the most famous meteorite crater is the Arizona crater, and I photographed that some time ago. It's nearly a mile wide. And impacts like that can cause a great deal of devastation. That must have hit the Earth more than 20,000 years ago. But there may have been greater impacts in the past, bearing in mind that the Earth is more than 4,000 million years old. So could we be hit by a large meteorite, an asteroid, call it what you will? And the answer is, yes, we could. And there is a theory that something like 65 million years ago, the Earth was struck by a large asteroid several miles across, and the change in climate resulting from that was so tremendous that the dinosaurs actually couldn't cope and died out. Well, it is a theory. What do you think about it, Ewan? I, I think the part which suggests that a very large asteroid did hit the Earth certainly has a certain level of feasibility. Small meteorites hit the Earth with the frequency of what sort of Britain gets hit once every 10 years or thereabouts. If we saw a large asteroid approaching us, could we divert it in any way nowadays? The answer is yes, if we had enough warning. The best way of diverting an asteroid is to give an impulse to its orbit mm. when it's at aphelion, the furthest distance from the sun. It needs less energy there. Now, in order to do that, you need warning so that you can send your rockets out to a distance of 2 to 3 AU, that needs six months' warning. Now, we, therefore, if you don't get six months' warning, you can't do it. We've also got to consider comets, most of which go around the sun in very eccentric orbits. The only bright comet that comes back regularly is, of course, Halley's Comet. Witness this lovely picture taken at the last return, that of 1986, courtesy of Royal Observatory Edinburgh. Now, the nucleus of a comet is essentially icy. In the case of Halley, covered by a dark deposit and rather less than 20 miles across. And we know that because in 1986, the Giotto space probe went right inside Halley's comet and sent back a series of magnificent close-range pictures right up to a few seconds before closest approach. At that stage, of course, Halley had a tail. But comets don't always have tails. When a comet's a long way from the sun, it's merely an inert lump, has no tail at all. But as it draws inwards, the ices in the nucleus start to boil off, and the comet develops a head and a tail, and the tail always points away from the sun. And as the comet recedes, the tail disappears, and finally the comet reverts to being merely an inert piece of material. Now, that means, of course, that every time a comet passes perihelion, or closest point to the sun, it loses a certain amount of material to form a head and the tail. So eventually, that material must be exhausted. And I just wonder, we know of small inert asteroids. Can it be that they are simply comets that have lost all their gas? In fact, are some asteroids, particularly the Earth grazers, dead comets? What do you think, Ewan? Yes, I, th I think there's a certain credibility in what you're saying. After all, when they do form a tail, it is the volatiles that are lost predominantly. And if you lose the volatile predominantly, you will sooner or later be left with a dust-covered nucleus which looks pretty much like an asteroid. And we have an artist's impression on the screen of what such an asteroid uh, may well 
look like as an X comet, comet nucleus. Um, another similarity between these Earth-creating asteroids and comets comes straight away from their orbits. Now, I'm not suggesting all cometary orbits no. and all asteroid orbits are the same thing, but certainly there is a similarity between uh, some of them, um, and, and indeed, to some extent, you may well be very hard-placed to tell the difference. If we s look on the screen, we now have a random selection coming up. Uh, one in each case is an asteroid, one in each case is a comet. And really, you cannot tell the difference between an asteroid and a comet in that case. Another clue came with the discovery of object Phaethon. Now, that is closely associated with the Geminid meteor stream, um, and everybody believes that, in fact, it must be the parent of the Geminid meteor stream. Uh, Phaethon's orbit is, in fact, the third one out, and the remainder are the meteors from the Geminid stream. So it's very closely related. Now, popularly, we believe that meteors do indeed come from comets, and therefore that would say Phaethon is a comet. On the other hand, it has an orbit like an asteroid. It f sort of feels like an asteroid. It goes nearer the sun than any other known asteroid, and people somehow think maybe it's an asteroid, but maybe it's a comet. And it may well be the missing link, which we're looking for. Well, there could be another missing link, too. What about Charon, that extraordinary object that spends most of its time between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus? And there's the discovery picture by Charles Cowell in 1977. Charon with that streak at the bottom there. What do you think about that? Certainly, Chiron, um, about two years ago, brightened very considerably more than one might expect just because it's approaching the sun. And, in fact, some evidence came to light that it had a coma. Um, if we look on the screen, we can see Chiron bang in the middle. The objects um, on the outside are, in fact, stars. But inside the circle, we see where Chiron is. And if we look at 11 o'clock, there's fairly clear evidence of something um, ejecting and spreading outwards from there towards the top left of the screen. And that has been interpreted as a coma. So Chiron might be a comet. Too large, isn't it, there? It is a very large object, indeed. It certainly would be the largest um, asteroid, largest comet, rather, um, if it were to prove to be the case. Now, another object has been found in more or less the same region, in fact, slightly further out. 1992 AD goes even further out than Chiron and crosses the orbit of Neptune. Extraordinary. You know, some time ago, an irritated German astronomer described asteroids as vermin of the skies because plates taken for quite different reasons kept on turning up and where they weren't wanted. Well, I think that was most unkind. The asteroids are important. They are interesting. Do you think we'll ever send missions there, manned missions, I mean? We might. We have the technology to get there, obviously, since Voyager went further out. Certainly, if we got there, it would be a lot easier to get off and come home again because the gravitation field is almost negligible. You know, the asteroids may be the junior members of the Sun's family, but they are getting more and more interesting as you learn more and more about them. And there's now a good chance to see one for yourself. Vesta, the brightest of the asteroids, it's near the star Beta Leonis in the constellation of the Lion. And here are three sketches made with binoculars by Danny Hardesty. And the first one, the left-hand one, was made on February the 28th, the middle one on March the 1st, and the right-hand one on March the 3rd. Now, the bright star over to the left is Denebola, or Beta Leonis, and Vesta is the dot over to the right-hand side, and you can see how it's moved over that period of observation. So, by all means, find Vesta. You can do it with binoculars, but, of course, it will look exactly like a star, and the only way you can tell it is an asteroid is by checking its position from one night to another. So, Ewan, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Patrick, for inviting me. And don't forget, if you want the latest information, check on our information line, Dial 0898 or check on CFAX, page 626. When I come back next month, I'll be joined by Dr. David Malin from Australia, and he's going to show us the latest in his superb pictures of nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies. So until then, good night.